Hello and welcome to lecture 18 of Foundations of Artificial Intelligence. Today we're going to cover two broad families of search methods. We'll begin with uninformed and then we'll move to heuristic search algorithms. In our last lecture we started by giving an introduction to intelligent agents and then we moved on to a brief introduction to search itself then discussed a bit about visualizing search that will be particularly useful in understanding the different methods we're going to learn in today's search lecture. And then we learned some of the basics of the broad families of search algorithms. In today's lecture, we're going to focus on particular kinds of search algorithms, learning how each one works. We'll begin by examining a variety of uninformed search methods, including breadth-first search, depth-first search, iterative deepening search, bidirectional search, and uniform cost search. Then we'll move on to heuristic search methods, giving particular focus to two kinds of best first search methods, starting with greedy search and then moving on to the A star algorithm. So recall from our last lecture that when we're dealing with uninformed search, we have no idea if one non-goal state is better than another. Further, we can only see the cost of the frontier states or those states that we can transition to next. Uninformed search is also known as brute force search and it generally can only be applied to smaller or tractable problems. On the other hand, heuristic search tends to be applied when we need to better prioritize our search to get a better chance of finding a solution more quickly. Heuristic search also requires an evaluation function in order to estimate how close any given node or state that we might currently be in is to the goal. As we also learn, there's a variety of different search algorithms out there including a number of uninformed search methods that we'll cover today, a set of heuristic search methods that we'll also cover today, some local search methods that we'll cover in our next lecture, including beam search and hill climbing, and there's also search methods for constraint satisfaction, as well as this idea of adversary search, and further some other population-based search methods that we'll learn about also in our next lecture. Also, recall from our last lecture, we learned some of the basic properties of search algorithms. Different search algorithms can be complete, optimal, have different time complexities, space complexities. Further, if this is a search tree, search trees have different breadths and depths. And we can use the breadth and depth of a tree to calculate how many nodes are in the entire tree. In this search tree, we always start our search at the top of the tree and work our way down using some strategy. In these illustrations that we'll see in the lecture, these red circles correspond to possible solutions or they both might be reasonable solutions that we want to find. So today in discussing search algorithms, we're going to start with two of the simplest search techniques, breadth first search or BFS and depth first search or DFS. Ultimately, these two search methods differ in how a tree or a search tree is traversed. However, all nodes in either tree using either approach will eventually be explored. Both methods rely on creating a list of nodes that have been found, but have yet to be further explored or examined specifically. In other words, their successors haven't been examined yet. Here, this list is known as the agenda. So now let's focus on our first uninformed search approach, breadth first search. And here we have a cartoon sort of illustrating how this is gonna work conceptually. Breadth first search always examines the shallowest node first. If we picture our search tree in this way, where we have our starting state at the center and our goal somewhere out here on the edge of the tree, in this case here, breadth first search always examines one step away from the initial state first. And then after that's done, it moves to two steps away from the initial search state and so on. So the simple idea here is that we always search the things that are closest to our starting point first or shallowest in the search tree. Here's a search graph we saw in our last lecture. And we can see the same search graph represented as a search tree below. We can see here in the tree how the search path is arranged, first looking at the starting point, and then moving on to the next level in the tree, then the third, then the fourth, and so on. By convention, we're always going to go left to right as we search through a tree. So in breadth first search, we'll start with S, and then we'll go D, E, P, and search those after S. Afterwards, we'll go through and search B, C, E, H, R, and Q. So again, the takeaway is that at each level in the tree, or as we move one step away from the starting point, we're going to search breadth first as we go across each level, subsequently moving down the tree. Here we see a specific example of breadth first search laid out using this other search tree pictured here. Here we have our starting state, and we have the rest of the search tree below. In this case, K is our goal we're trying to find. 
So this algorithm starts at S, moves to A, then to B, because we're gonna search this level one first, moving left to right. Then we're gonna to move to level two from B, we'll move to C, then D, then G, then H. Then next to level three, E, F, I. And finally to level four, where we find K, which happens to be our goal in this situation. Breath First Search uses what's called a first in, first out queue or agenda. So whenever search nodes are added from our frontier, they'll be examined last in terms of what's left in the queue. So at this point, let's take a look how we're gonna search through an example tree, as well as look at how the agenda or the queue is updated along the way. So let's say we have this tree where S0 is our starting state. So S0 is initially in our search queue. Here at the beginning when we only have S0 on our queue, the search frontier represents just all of its possible successors. So in this case, S1 and S2. So since S0 is the only thing in our queue, we're gonna take it off the queue and add its successors to the queue. So now S1 and S2 are both added to the queue. So this is what our queue looks like at this point because S0 has been removed and we've confirmed it's not the goal when we've removed it from the queue. Because our queue is first in, first out, the first node in our queue that we're gonna examine is gonna be S1. So first we check if S1 is our goal, which it's not, and then it's removed from the queue. We then add S1's successors, which in this case are S3 and S4. These are subsequently added to our queue, which leaves our queue now at S2, S3, and S4. Again, because this is a first in, first out queue, we're now gonna look at S2, our next state. This is gonna be taken off the queue, and we're gonna find it has the successor of S5. So now at this point, S5 gets added to our queue, and S2 is removed. So this is the current state of our queue. Also at this point, we've searched these nodes and confirmed they're not our goal state, and we're not ready to stop our search. The next state in our queue is S3. So we take it off the queue and find that there's no successors, so our queue is left as S4 and S5. Then S4 is the next item in our queue, so we examine it, taking it off the queue, and find that it also has no successors, which leaves us a queue of S5. Lastly, S5 is taken off the queue as we examine its state, and it also has no successors, so our queue is empty and our search would end. Had we found the goal along this process, we would have stopped the search along the way. Again, note that with breath first search, we start with our starting state, we move down to the first level in the tree, we search left to right, which is somewhat of an arbitrary convention, but one we'll stick to in this course. We'll search all of these search states at level two before moving on to level three and moving again left to right. Often one part of search that's important is understanding the path that it took to get to the goal and not just finding the goal state itself. During the search process, we can ensure that we keep track of our search path to the goal in a couple of ways. One example is that we can record the predecessor state when labeling a new state. And by this I mean adding that state to the queue. So when I add goal to the queue, I was expanding from a transition from F. So we're now keeping track that we got to the goal by having moved from F. And earlier in the search, we might have noted that we got to F through some transition from R. So once we reach the final solution, we'll know all of the steps it took to finally get to our goal. In this case, we started at start, move to E, then to R, then to F, and finally the goal. We could also use back pointers at any given node transition that indicates the predecessor node from which any given state was reached. So for example, when we find F, we might store a back pointer to R, which was the state that allowed us to reach F. And then after finding the goal, we can use this set of back pointers to move back and trace back the path to our starting state and find the best search path. Now that, we, now that we understand the basics of how breadth first search works, let's take a look at some of its basic properties. When talking about search algorithms, we'll often ask, what does that algorithm expand next? Again, expanding refers to which states do we add their successor states to the queue. When it comes to breadth first search, we're gonna process all the nodes above the shallowest solution. So in this case, if our red dot was a solution, but maybe not the optimal solution, Breath first search would proceed until it reached that solution that had the lowest depth. If our blue circle was the optimal solution, we would never actually find it. Breath first search has a time complexity of b to the power of s, where s is the depth of our shallowest solution, and b is the breadth of our search tree. 
Another property of breadth first search that we might consider is how much space does the fringe take? Recall that the fringe is the set of search nodes that have yet to be explored, but are all successor states of the nodes of the tree that we've searched so far. Here the fringe occurs at roughly the last tier, so the space is about b to the s as well. In asking if breadth first search is complete, in other words, will we find a solution if it exists, then yes, breadth first search is complete, since this kind of search will always find an existing solution, or at least the shallowest solution that's available in the search tree. In asking the question, is it optimal? We can say that this search method is optimal if there's one best solution and the costs to make each transition through the tree are all equal. If those transition costs aren't equal, that's when we'll need something like uniform cost search, which we'll learn about later. In terms of limitations for breadth first search, the memory use is of time complexity b to the s in general, which can be rather large. This kind of search is limited in many problems in which the states cannot be enumerated or stored explicitly. In other words, where you have very large search spaces. This kind of search has problems when there's a very large branching factor. As an alternative, you might want to find a search strategy that requires little storage for use in large problems. Next, we turn to our second uniform search method called depth first search. Here we see a cartoon illustrating the rough idea of this kind of search. Using the same illustration of a circular search tree with our starting point and goal, depth first search expands the deepest node first rather than exploring the entire first level of breadth. So here, we start by selecting a direction and we go deep all the way to the end. Once we've reached the end, we can backtrack to our next closest branch and explore that to the end, and then all the way back up until that branch is completely explored. Here again is the search graph we've seen a number of times and its corresponding search tree. Again, by convention, we're always gonna go left to right in making arbitrary decisions involving node search. So in this case, depth first search will again start at our starting state We'll start with the leftmost node of our first level, but then we'll take a deep dive all the way through the leftmost branch. So in this case, the expansion order, starting from state S, goes to D, then to B, then to A. But then we backtrack up to the next branch possible, which in this case will be C. Then we move as far deep in the tree as we can again, which takes us to A. But then we have to backtrack, go back up all the way to D, and then we can branch through E. Then we make our way all the way through the leftmost depth branch, so to H, then P, then Q, backtrack, go to Q, backtrack again, go to R, F, C. We can see this expansion ordering I've just discussed right here. Here's yet another illustration of the depth first search procedure. Again, starting from our start state at level zero, we go down our leftmost branch just by convention, and we follow all the way to the deepest node possible down that branch, again, sticking to the left first. When we reach the bottom, we backtrack until we find a branch, and then we go deep again. So in this case, we start at S, move to A, B, D, backtrack to B, and explore E as our next expanded node, backtrack again as needed all the way up to A, then we go down to C, and then deep all the way to G. If this wasn't the goal state, we would have backtracked all the way back up to our next possible branch, which would have taken us down this route. Depth first search uses a first in, last out queue, or philo. So in this case, the first thing added to the queue is also the very first thing we're gonna expand. This allows us to go deep rather than broad across branches of the tree. Let's take a look at the depth first search, again, looking at how the queue gets updated along the way. We'll use a similar example to the one we saw in breadth first search. Again, we start at S0 as our starting state, and so S0 is originally on our queue. As it's the only thing on the queue, it gets taken off first, and we find it has its successors S1 and S5. Both are added to the queue. S1 was the first thing added to the list, so it's the first thing removed from the queue. And we find it has successors S2 and S4, which are also added to the queue, as we see here. Since S2 was most recently added, S2 is now taken off the queue, and we find it has successor S3, which is now added to our search queue. Again, since S3 is the most recently added state, we now expand that node, and it's taken off the queue with no successors, leaving us a queue of S4 and S5. So the next item on our queue to be expanded is S4. This is in line with backtracking up the tree until we find another branch and going down to S4. So at this point, S4 is taken off the queue, 
and we're left just with S5. Now S5 is taken off the queue as it's the only thing on the list, which has a successor of S6. Lastly, S6 is taken off the queue, and we have nothing more in our queue, so our search ends. Again, if we had found the goal at any point along the way, we would have stopped the search. Now let's look at some of the depth-first search algorithm properties. First, what nodes does depth-first search expand? We've already mentioned they expand some left prefix of the tree. Regarding time complexity, if we assume the depth of the tree is finite, it'll take b to the power of m time complexity to complete this search. We can roughly see the search process first going deep in the leftmost branches and then slowly moving to the right uh, as we go from top to bottom of the tree. In terms of how much space the fringe takes up, or in, in other words, this is a reflection of how much memory is required to conduct the search, here the fringe only requires a search complexity of b times m. This is because depth-first search only has siblings on the path to the root. In asking if depth-first search is complete, it's possible that any branch all the way down to the bottom of the tree could end up being infinite, as we've seen in some earlier examples of how search graphs being converted to search trees can end up giving us some infinite tree branches. So depth-first search is only complete if either there are no infinite tree depth branches, or if we prevent in infinite search cycles in our search procedure. Regarding whether this kind of search is optimal, the answer is no. This kind of search will only find the leftmost solution regardless of the depth or the cost. So for example, here we have two possible solutions, and if we assume it's always better to find a shallower solution, depth-first search will actually first find the leftmost search regardless of the fact that it's actually deeper in and possibly costs more to get to it. Some other points on depth-first search the only way depth-first search is better than breadth-first search is regarding the memory space that's required to conduct the search. So at times it can be better for larger scale problems. However, the main issue that occurs with depth-first search is if the depth is infinite down any of the branches. In this case, you can imagine the search getting lost down some infinite path and never getting to explore the whole tree. Because of this, depth-first search is not really great on its own. However, there are two very useful modifications to depth-first search that can help address some of these issues. The first is depth-limited depth-first search, also known as DLS, and we'll talk about this on the next slide. Depth-limited depth-first search is just like depth-first search, but it's run only to a specific depth and then stops at that branch, but it's only allowed to search to some finite user-specified depth. This approach requires something called path checking. Another strategy to expand depth-first search is called Iterative Deepening Depth-First Search, or IDS. We'll cover this in the next section. So first, we'll talk briefly about depth-limited search. In this case, we have a search tree, and we've specified as a user that we only want to search to level 2 in a depth-limited search. In this case, we conduct a normal depth-first search as if the tree only includes the nodes up to level 2 and these nodes at level three don't even exist. So in this case, we start with our starting node, move down the leftmost branch as deep as we can, then backtrack up to our next node going deep, and then we do this again, in this case, moving to B, then finally I, then to J. In this situation, if our goal had been here at G, we never would have found the solution. We've talked about these search algorithms operating on trees, but let's take a moment to think about their application to graphs or search graphs. If we apply these search algorithms to graphs rather than trees, at best, they will be less efficient. In other words, they might have to redo work that's already done. And at worst, they could get caught in an infinite loop. To avoid infinite loops, we can avoid adding any node to the agenda if it's already appeared. This could be easy to conduct programmatically if the agenda included not just the nodes that we could add next, but the entire paths to those nodes. This is something we would have already done if we were using the recovering the path approach that we described in an earlier slide. Here, each item on the agenda is a path to the node that could be examined next. So for instance, instead of just having S1 and S2 on the agenda, we would add S1 as a series of steps it took to get to S1. In this case, maybe just from our starting point to S1. And for S2, maybe we had just the starting point and then a transition to S2. So using such approaches, we can address some of the efficiency problems with these algorithms by keeping a record of already searched nodes, in other words, nodes that have already been visited or the closed list, and to have the search algorithms modified to not revisit such nodes. 
Now we'll move on to what is actually our fourth uninformed search, specifically iterative deepening search. Iterative deepening search is another expansion of the depth first search approach. However, this search is applied in iterations where we first search to a depth limit of one, then a depth limit of two, then three, and so on and so forth. So the first iteration of this algorithm starts at our starting state and does a depth first search of just the first level. Then we start the whole search over again from the start point, now allowing a depth of two and conducting the entire search. The idea behind an iterative deepening search is to get depth first searches space advantage or memory advantages and combine them with breadth first searches, better runtime and shallow solution finding advantages. So again, the way this proceeds would be to start with a depth first search with a depth limit of one. And if there's no solution, move on to a depth first search with a depth of two, and then keep going until one of these iterations finds a solution. An obvious thought that might pop into your head is, isn't this wastefully redundant in terms of having to research nodes higher up in the tree? Well, notably, most of the actual search work happens at the lowest levels of the search. So this ends up being a pretty low cost for the benefits that you can get from an iterative deepening search. So now let's work through an example of an iterative deepening search. Here we have our search tree and our goal as usual. In our first iteration of this algorithm, we start at the first level. And so we only search A. In the second iteration, we go to a level of one. So now we do a depth first search starting at A, we go deep to B, and then we backtrack and go to C. In our third iteration, we again start at A, move to B and then D because we're doing depth first. Then we backtrack, go to E, and then backtrack to C, then F, then backtrack finally to G, our goal state where in this case, we might have solved the problem. So here in this third iteration, the algorithm has found the goal node. And so we'd stop the search. If the search had continued to a fourth iteration, our search would have proceeded from A to B to D to H, then to I, then to E, then to C, F, K, and finally to G. Here we do an initial comparison of some of the properties of these three main search algorithms. In this case, they're all complete. Breath first search and iterative deepening search are conditionally optimal, while depth first search is not guaranteed to be optimal. And then we have the time and space complexities of each here. Note here that breath first search and iterative deepening search has the same time complexity, even though iterative deepening search is actually utilizing depth first search, but over slowly increasing depth cycles. Also note that breath first search has the largest space requirement in general, iterative deepening search is the preferred uniform search method when the state space is large and the depth of the solution is unknown. Here we can see increasing complexity of the problem. And here we see the ratio of computational complexity between iterative deepening and depth first search. When the search space is really simple, iterative deepening has a larger compute cost to depth first search. But also keep in mind that depth first search is not guaranteed to find an optimal solution. Well, iterative deepening is. Notice that as the search space gets bigger, the added computational cost of running iterative deepening compared to depth first search narrows greatly to the point where they're almost equivalent. And when the problem is complex, iterative deepening is also able to find the optimal solution. This is why iterative deepening is considered to be advantageous over depth first search in these circumstances. Next, let's discuss another uninformed search called bidirectional search. Bidirectional search is a breadth first search that's conducted both from the start and the goal at the same time. So here we're ultimately trying to find where the search fringes meet between the starting state and the goal state. The advantage here is that it has a slightly smaller time complexity than regular breadth first search. So again, with bidirectional search, we wanna simultaneously search from the start point and backwards from the goal, and we wanna stop when we meet in the middle. To do this, we'll also need to keep track of the intersection of two open sets of nodes. So what does searching backwards from G mean? Here we need a way to specify the predecessors of G, and this can be difficult. For example, what would be the predecessors of checkmate in a game of chess? There are also questions such as, which goal do I start with if there are multiple start states? And where do we start if there's only a goal test, but no explicit list? The point here is that you can't always use bidirectional search it's only appropriate for certain problems. Here we can see bidirectional search in action where we apply, where we apply breadth first search moving towards an intersection 
again from our root node as well as from our goal node, seeing where they intersect. We can see here that in contrast with the other search algorithms we've already explored, bidirectional search is also complete, it can be optimal, and it has a lower time complexity than breadth-first search or iterative deepening. Because this search is specific to certain kinds of problems, you won't need to understand the specifics of this search for this course, but I wanted to make sure that you were aware that it existed. The next kind of uninformed search we're gonna cover is a uniform cost search. To understand this, let's go back to our simple Pac-Man example and assume that any action is a movement, either up, down, left, or right, and that to make a movement costs just one to make each state transition. So in this Pac-Man example, we might wanna figure out how to get to this goal point using the shortest path through this maze. Lots of paths are possible, but some are shorter than others and thus have a lower cost and would be a more optimal solution. When it comes to the other uninformed search algorithms that we've covered, they haven't taken costs into account, where costs are indicated on the transition edges from one state to the next. So for example, to go from start to D, we have a cost of three. And to go from D to E, we have a cost of two. The uniform cost search method is a generalization of the breadth first search method. However, the queue that's used is different. Here we use a priority queue of nodes to be explored or expanded. Here, the cost function is applied to each node. The way the queue here works is that we begin by adding the initial state to our priority queue. And while the queue is not empty, the node that we want to expand next is the head of the queue or the item in the queue that has the least cost. If during the search, the goal is found, then just return the goal. So again, the uniform cost search uses a priority queue, in other words, the agenda, based on the cost where the lowest cost node is chosen to be explored next, rather than just what's first on the queue or what's last on the queue, as we saw in breadth-first and depth-first search. The only modification here is that when exploring a node, we cannot disregard it if it's already been explored by another node. This is because we might have found a shorter path and thus need to update the cost on that node. A little bit more on a priority queue. A priority queue is a data structure in which you can insert and retrieve key value pairs with the following operations. You can either push a value into the queue or you can remove it and return that value from the queue. This way you can insert new items at specific locations within the queue based on their cost function. Unlike a regular queue, insertions aren't constant in time and usually have this kind of time complexity. We'll need priority queues for any kind of cost sensitive search methods in general. When it comes to a uniform cost search, it's important to note that we're going to sum the costs along the entire path up to a specific node, and then we'll always expand the cheapest node first. Here we have a search graph with costs along the different edges, and we have the corresponding search tree here. These contoured colored segments indicate different groupings of nodes that cost a different amount to get to. When I say that we sum the cost along each path, let me give an example. Let's say we're starting at our start point and we wanna decide whether we wanna first transition to D, to E, or to P. Our transition to P has a cost of one, our transition to D has a cost of three, and our transition to E has a cost of nine. So in this case, our priority queue would say that we wanna expand P first because it has the lowest cost to get to. At this point, node Q would be added to our search agenda. Then we wanna ask which of these nodes on the queue do we wanna expand next? At this point, our options are still D, E, but now also Q. We'll now calculate the cost to get each of these nodes as the sum of costs along the path. To get to D, it only still takes three. To get to E, it only still takes nine. But to get to Q, now takes one plus 15. So at this point, the next node we'd want to expand would be D because it only costs three to get there rather than nine or 16. Here's an illustration of the uniform cost search in action. In this case, we'd start at S and we'd have our first options of A or B. Because A is cheaper to get to, A would be expanded first, at which point C and D would be added to our queue. The cost of getting to C would be a total of four, one plus three. The cost of getting to B is also four. And our cost of getting to D would be one plus two, which is three, meaning that D would be the next node for us to expand. Notably, as soon as we expand a node that leads to the goal, our search stops here. So at this point, we would move directly from D to G and our search would be concluded. This happens even if there's a shorter path to another node that isn't our goal from D. 
With uniform cost search, our cost function looks like this, where f of n is equal to the sum of the transition costs to any given node. Now let's walk through how the priority queue changes along the search process. We initialize starting with s on the queue, and it's closed, leading to opening a and b. At this iteration, getting to a as a cost of 1 and getting to b as a cost of 4. So we decide to close a, and at this point, c and d get added to our queue. Getting to c has a cost of 1 plus 3 equals 4, and getting to d has a cost of 1 plus 2, which equals 3. This leaves us the options of b, c, and d to go to next, so we pick d since it has the lowest cost. At this point, we close d, and our queue has just c and b remaining. Because we've closed d, we now add f and g to our open list, and we evaluate their cost. In this case, g is our goal, so we jump directly to it, and our search is concluded. Now let's look at some of the properties of uniform cost search. First, what nodes does the uniform cost search expand? Well, it processes all nodes with costs less than the cheapest solution. We can see the estimated time complexity here for uniform cost search, and we can see a similar memory cost of the fringe. Regarding completeness, assuming the best solution has a finite cost and the minimum arc cost is positive, then yes, uniform cost search is complete. Additionally, the uniform cost search is also optimal. Here we can see another table comparing some of these search algorithms. We won't get into this further right now. So when we look at the search pattern of uniform cost search, it explores increasing cost contours as it goes down through the search tree. We've seen that uniform cost search is both complete and optimal, but the bad is that it explores in every direction of the tree, and there's no information about where the goal's location might be. All we have to go on in this situation are cost transitions from one state to the next. There's no other guiding light to help us better navigate through the search space. We'll see why this is important when we get to our heuristic search in the next sections. So at this point, we have a table illustrating some of the main properties of the search algorithms we've covered so far. Breadth-first search, uniform cost search, depth-first search, depth-limited search, iterative deepening, or DLS, and bidirectional search. In general, we'd want to use iterative deepening algorithms that are both complete and optimal when there's uniform cost transitions from one state to the next. And if there are different cost transitions, then we want to use uniform cost search, which is also complete and optimal. Next, we're going to give an introduction to heuristic search methods. Heuristic search methods rely on a heuristic function. The idea behind heuristic search is to find a more promising path through the search tree. It takes the current state of the search agent as its input and produces an estimation of how close it is from the goal. The heuristic method, however, might not always give the best solution, but it is guaranteed to find a good solution in a reasonable amount of time. Any domain knowledge used in the search to estimate distance from goal is encoded in the heuristic function given as a function of h. In general, a positive value for this heuristic function is found for all nodes in the search space. When h equals zero, it implies that n is at the goal node, and a heuristic function value of infinity applies that n is in a dead end that can never lead to the goal. To better understand search heuristics, let's go back to our Pac-Man example. Let's say Pac-Man is at this location in the maze, and our goal is to get to this location. In exploring search paths to the goal, so far we've examined methods that would look exhaustively at all possible paths to finding the goal, and we've looked at uniform cost search that takes into account the cost to get to the goal. However, for some problems, we have a rough idea or an estimate of how far we are from the goal, and we can use this to better guide search. So in the Pac-Man problem, if we know where the goal is from a bird's eye view, we can estimate the distance from Pac-Man to the goal using different distance metrics. For example, a Manhattan distance or Euclidean distance, where Euclidean distance is basically an as the crow flies distance calculation, and Manhattan distance would be the sum of the x and y distances to the goal. In general, a search heuristic should be easy to compute on the fly. Otherwise, the overhead of computing the heuristic could outweigh the time saved by reducing the search. What about the option of pre-computing and storing heuristics for the entire search space? Well, this can be problematic if your search space is huge or if you have a goal that is dynamic or changing over time. We could think of heuristics as being either weak or strong methods. We use the term weak methods to refer to methods that are extremely general 
and not tailored to a specific situation or problem. Examples of weak methods include means and analysis, which is a strategy in which we try to represent the current situation and where we want to end up, and then look for ways to shrink the differences between the two. Another is space splitting, which is a strategy in which we try to list the possible solutions to a problem and then try to rule out classes of these possibilities. Then there's subgoaling. This is a means to split a large problem into several smaller ones that can be solved one at a time. These are called weak methods because they do not take advantage of more powerful domain-specific heuristics that we may or may not have on hand. Here are the first heuristic search methods we'll cover in this course. Today we'll focus on two different best first search approaches, and in our next lecture we'll cover some local search methods. Similar to the uninformed search that we've already covered, today we're going to focus on heuristic search methods that exhaustively examine the search space. So in particular, this is going to be relevant to best first search approaches. Recall that when I say an exhaustive search, I mean that we're going to come up with a strategy to examine the entire tree in search for a goal. In thinking about these heuristic search methods, the first step is to construct an evaluation function. This evaluation function can either be the estimated distance from a given node to the goal, in other words, the heuristic distance, and this is what would be used by greedy best first search, which we'll cover first, or the evaluation function could be a combination of the cost transitions, which we've covered in uniform cost search, plus this heuristic distance. This is what would be used in the A star algorithm. Notably, there are no real limitations on what an evaluation function can include. Any function of your choice that's addressing the problem at hand could be acceptable. The real question when you pick an evaluation function is will it help the search algorithm to find a solution more effectively or find an optimal solution better? Now that we're armed with a bit of an introduction to heuristic search, let's look at our first heuristic search algorithm, in particular, the greedy best first search. Greedy best first search is also known as a pure heuristic search. It's algorithmically similar to the uniform cost search in that successor nodes are evaluated and then added to the agenda. And best nodes are removed from the list at each step, or they're explored first at each step. However, the best node is now based on a heuristic metric other than just the transition of cost metric that we covered in uniform cost search. Greedy best first search is also using a priority queue, and it maintains two lists, an open and a closed one, as we saw with uniform cost search. In the closed list, it places those nodes which we've already expanded, and in the open list, it places nodes which have not yet been expanded, which are making up the frontier. At each iteration, each node n with the lowest heuristic value is expanded and generates all of its successors, and then n is placed on the closed list. Let's take a look at greedy best first search in action. Here we have a search tree with our starting state and our goal state, and here we have all the heuristic distances from each state to the goal mapped out in this table. So in other words, the estimated distance from state A to the goal is 12, and the estimated distance from state D to the goal is 3. Note that this is not based on any path length through the tree or any sum of costs of transitions from one state to the next. Rather, these heuristic values are based on some global knowledge we might have about the problem in terms of how close one state or another is to the goal itself. Here is our evaluation function. Again, it's only based on our heuristic distance and not in a cost transitions like in uniform cost search. Here we can see how the search path might play out in this tree. The numbers next to each node represent the corresponding heuristic distance found in the table. So in other words, the starting state has a distance of 13 from the goal, B has a distance of four from the goal, F has a distance of two, and so on and so forth. So when we initialize the search, we close S, our starting state, and we open the two successor nodes, A and B. We now need to choose from this priority queue of A and B which node to expand first. So we look at the heuristic costs of both, where A has a cost of 12 and B has a cost of 4. Since B has a lower cost, we choose to expand that node first and close it. When we close B, its successors, E and F, are added to the open queue. So now our queue includes E, F, and A, 
and S and B have been closed. At this point, we also look at the heuristic distance of E and F, and we decide which of E, F, and A we want to expand next. Since F has the lowest cost of all three, F is closed next, leaving us just E and F on our open queue. When we close F, we now expand I and G and add them to our queue, giving us a queue of I, G, E, and A. At this point, our goal has made it into our open queue, and so our search is completed and we found the goal. Notably, goal also has a distance of zero, meaning that would have been the next, meaning that would have been the next natural node to go to. Let's explore some of the properties of greedy best first search. Notably, it has properties similar to depth first search, but without the space benefits. Its time complexity is b to the m, where m is depth to a solution. It also has that same space complexity. Like depth first search, greedy best first search is also incomplete even if the given state space is finite. Further, greedy best first search is not optimal. So from this, you might wonder why we'd want to use greedy best first search. In general, the greedy best first search is only really advantageous if the evaluation function is really good at helping us get to our goal faster. Otherwise, we're just as well off using simple search methods like breadth first search and depth first search. Regarding, regarding other advantages of greedy search, we can switch between breadth-first search and depth-first search, potentially gaining the advantages of each. Further, it's more efficient than breadth-first search and depth-first search, given that you have some good evaluation function. As a disadvantage, it can be thought of as unguided depth-first search in the worst-case scenario. Additionally, it can get stuck in an infinite loop, just like a depth-first search. And as I mentioned before, it's not optimal. What else can go wrong with a greedy search? Well, let's imagine this scenario where we have a starting state and a goal state, and we have these other states sort of laid out based on their heuristic distance from the goal. Well, since a greedy search is always trying to expand the node that seems closest to the goal, so in this case, we can see that A is closer to the goal than B, we might end up taking a longer search route to reach the goal than had we might have if we had first taken a step further from the goal initially. So just to review, Greedy search has the advantage of, in some common cases, allowing you to go straight to some suboptimal goal. However, in the worst case, it behaves like a badly guided depth first search, exploring a huge amount of search space before reaching a suboptimal goal. And it can get stuck in infinite loops, as I mentioned before. Greedy search is also like depth first search with regards to completeness. The last section of this lecture is going to focus on another heuristic search method called the A star algorithm. The A star algorithm is another best first search method, similar to the greedy search. You can think of it as having conceptually combined the features of UCS or uniform cost search, as well as greedy best first search. Effectively, it's similar to the uniform cost search, except that it uses both the cost distance and the heuristic distance instead of just the cost distance alone. So our evaluation function looks like this, where we have the transition costs, and our heuristic distance. Notably, A star is the most commonly known form of best first search and an extremely popular and widely used search algorithm. Now let's take a look at how the A star algorithm works. Here we have another search tree and we have our table of heuristic distances from any given state to the goal state. Here's our evaluation function. Again, now it's a combination of transition costs labeled on these edges from one state to the other and our heuristic distance, again available in this heuristic distance table. Here we can see our search path in this example. Let's walk through how it operates using the queue. Again, we initialize by closing our starting state and adding our successors A and B to the queue. We now look at the evaluation function for both A and B. We get F of A by adding its transition cost from S to A, which is 3, to the heuristic cost of A, which is 12 giving us a total of 15. To get f of b, we take the transition cost from s to b, which is 2, and add it to the heuristic cost of b, which is 4, giving us a total of 6. So at this point, b has a lower evaluation function cost and will be the next node that we close. In closing b, we add its successors e and f to the queue. So now our queue includes e, f, and a. So at this point, we need the evaluation cost of both e and f to make a decision as to which item on our priority queue to expand next. F of E 
is a combination of the cost to get from S to E, in this case, two plus three, plus the cost to get from E to the goal, which in this case is eight. This gives us a total cost of 12. For F, we have a transition cost of two and then one, and we add this to a heuristic cost of two, which is five. So now we have to choose from A, E, and F, where we find that F has the lowest cost, and thus F is what we close next. In closing F, we add I and G, our goal state, to the open queue. Because our goal is now in the open queue, we've completed our search and found our goal. Now let's look at some of the properties of the A star algorithm. A star is complete as long as the branching factor is always finite, and every operator adds a cost greater than zero. The time and space complexity of A star is still b to the power of m in the worst case, since it must maintain and sort complete Q of unexplored options. However, with a good heuristic, it has the opportunity to find an optimal solution for many problems in a reasonable time. Again, with the A star algorithm, space complexity is a worse problem than time complexity. Let's look at some A star advantages and disadvantages. First, as an advantage, this search algorithm tends to expand less of the search tree and provides optimal results faster. It's considered to be the best of the search algorithms we've covered yet. It's also optimal and complete under certain circumstances, and it can solve very complex problems. As disadvantages, it doesn't always produce the shortest path as it's based on heuristics and approximation of distance to goal. It does still have some complexity issues, and its main drawback is its memory requirement. Specifically, it keeps all generated nodes in memory, so it's not practical for various large-scale problems. In today's lecture, we've covered a variety of search algorithms, specifically a set of uninformed search methods, including breadth-first search, depth-first search, depth-limited search, iterative deepening search, bidirectional search, which can only be used under certain situations, and uniform cost search. Next, we got an introduction to heuristic search and covered a couple of best first search algorithms, including greedy best first search and the A star algorithm. Here's today's quote. Search not a wound too deep, lest thou make a new one. Just a reminder, the final project proposal will be due soon. And remember to get started on assignment four. Check the syllabus for the specific due dates on both. As always, thank you for your attention and I'll see you in the next lecture.